I studied in Wageningen, the Agriculture University, molecular science. I, I, I really think it, it was at the time visionary. The reason it was visionary because it allowed students to combine completely different disciplines but that were preoccupied with, let's say, problems at the molecular level. So it was about understanding a certain scale. So you could, for example, do molecular biology together with quantum physics or colloid chemistry or physical chemistry. So you could really combine different points of view on a certain, let's say, scale or entities on a certain scale. What we try to understand is how functionality originates in the fundamental unit of life that is present in our bodies or in general in organisms, which is the cell. If you split a cell, there's no more life. So, in other words, that's the smallest living building block. Classically, it was always thought that genes, in a way, harbor or contain all the functionalities, which is in a way true or partially true. But what I think was wrong in the thinking is that the genes were self-contained functional entities. In other words, a single gene would manifest a functionality that takes place on another scale, which is in the order of micrometers, let's say. So typical cell scales are something like 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5 meters. However, gene products typically have a size of about nanometers. So we're, we're, we're talking about scales, or differences in scales, in order of three orders of magnitude. So the idea is more to understand how gene products, in that case are proteins, how their collective behavior actually generates a manifestation at a higher scale, on the micrometer scale, because that is where, in a way, shapes are formed, which is what function is, in a way. So the process of morphogenesis, the process of how molecules together can generate these shapes, is really what interest us. So it's pattern formation in a way. So one of the key features of living systems is that they actually do generate shapes, but these shapes are maintained by energy consumption. So that is very different than in a crystal where you have a system that's at energy minimum and it can be maintained forever without any energy consumption, whereas a living system has to work very hard to maintain shape and functionality. So the real core of what we try to do is understand how the dynamics of the systems, the molecular systems, generate a shape at a higher scale. So a lot of our activities is actually doing biochemistry inside the living system and for that we use microscopes. Obviously the microscope is an instrument that allows us to observe shapes at the correct dimension or at the correct scale, so in the order of micrometers. So we can very nicely see cells, we can see their shapes, we can see their organelles, but we cannot see the molecules, they're too small. So we then try to do, in order to see the life of the molecules inside the living system, we're trying to use a kind of a remote sensing. So we're trying to make use of properties of light to deduce how molecules are moving and how they interact. So basically these are now two microscopes where um, both of them we use um, the rapid decay of excited state of fluorescence to, to look at reaction states so we can measure protein interactions and by having a special method of having localized transfection of cells we can actually derive from our measurements the structure of a network, the causality structure. And from that we can actually derive the patterns or the dynamics of the system. Now the beauty about nature in a way is that these rules I was talking about, these rules that dictate organization, and in living system one could talk about self-organization, appear to happen at different scales. So you see very simple principles operate, for example, also in the way that insects build their, their, their colonies. So in the way that patterns are generated in a biological system that in a way can do random walks and have local interaction that are very similar to what we see happen in, in, in inside, inside cells. So in a way we can learn from other disciplines how macroscopic systems are built 
and try to see if these simple rules also apply to how structures are generated in the cell. This, um, this is basically a lab where we do uh, uh, super resolution, so we, we basically look at uh, fluorescence of single molecules um, based on the technique that we can, in a way, determine position of molecules very precisely, but we cannot resolve two points that are next to each other very precisely. Uh, so what we do is basically excite a very sparse amount of molecules, and uh, so you see them light up, determine their position very accurately, within let's say 20 nanometer precision, erase them and then do another set. So we then eliminate or reactivate other molecules and then again their position is determined very accurately and then we sum all these experiments. It can be up to hundreds of those experiments. In the end the summation means the position of all the molecules. So you get a complete map of where they are um, in the cell. And everything we do in science in a way is a, is a, is a way of looking at things and trying to explain them. Observation is a key feature and so that is something that is trained in scientists so they learn to observe properly, to really see. Actually artists have the same thing. And so I see it as one success that the type of approaches we started off more than 10 years ago are now really in a way in the mainstream of, of biological science as is known in systems biology. Um, which shows in a way that the revolution in molecular biology was really important, obviously, but not sufficient. And so, I, at least I count it as a success that I could be part of one of the pioneers that, that, that worked in, in, in that direction. <laughs>